All right, uh, we've been doing a series through Ecclesiastes, this is a random book in the Old Testament, and uh, this will be the fourth message in this series. And for those of you who may have not been with us, uh, just as a reminder, as we've done oh, every time, of this commonly used phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes, which really is a key to the whole book, and that is the word meaningless. It's repeated over and over and over and over again in this book that, you know, everything is meaningless, it's meaningless, it's meaningless. And as we have noted, this English word gets us off track a little bit uh, from the actual Hebrew word. And as scholars note, the, the Hebrew word gives us a whole different meaning to this book. And the Hebrew word means, it's havel, which means smoke, it means mist. It doesn't mean like it's completely meaningless as in junk. It just means it's, it's smoky. And life is smoky. And we've been talking about this idea of smoke that, that um, you know, we, we see smoke, but we can't quite grasp it. And smoke is a bit uncontrollable. It just kind of goes where the wind goes. And sometimes it goes in our eyes. And, you know, sometimes it goes the right way. And, and the author is saying that life is like that. Life is like smoke. We cannot control it. Sometimes it goes in different directions than we expect it to go, and, and that life is short, just like smoke. It only lasts as long as the flame, and so our life is short, and it's, it's uncontrollable, and so the, the author's been trying to help us see the gifts of God in the moment, instead of trying to control our future and, you know, I'll be happy if I retire, I'll be, I'll finally get there, you know, when I get all my money, or if I finish this reservation or a renovation, it's, it's not all about the future because you can't always control that. It's smoke that might not happen, but you can meet with God right now in the moment as you're renovating, renovating that house, as you're going to work, as you're carrying out the day to, to see God in the moment and to see every moment as a gift. That's kind of the general overview. And last week we talked, uh, there's kind of three major themes, work, pleasure, and wisdom in this book. And last week we talked about the idea of work and just some of the reflections. And of course, uh, this teacher, and one of the purpose of wisdom literature as we've taught, uh, talked about is to really stretch us and to even get us to a place that's quite uncomfortable. And, you know, he was very honest about work and the fact that work creates a lot of anxiety in us and sometimes it keeps us up at night and, and work can be very dangerous at times and work sometimes is super frustrating. But at the same time, he says, when you see work as a gift and you look for where God is at work, all of a sudden you can, your work can come alive in a new way. And he talked about, you know, not being lazy, both hands down, not working. He talked about not working too hard with both hands all the time, seven days a week. He talked about work and rest, that you have one hand work and you have another hand that's kind of resting, this balance he talked about. And today we're going to talk about pleasure. This is one of the other main topics of this book, is this idea of pleasure. And in chapter two, he says, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. He's doing kind of these, this life experiment where he is trying to find ultimate meaning in these different things and trying to take work, for example, and take it to its extreme to find the pluses and minuses and to see where God is in it. And he does this with pleasure. He kind of takes pleasure to the extreme, seeing the, the, the pros and the cons and where God is at work in pleasure. And so we're going to talk about God and pleasure today. You know, a lot of folks think God is kind of like this when it comes to pleasure. Uh, God is, you know, when we start to get, you know, too much pleasure in our life or we start to enjoy something too much, and God is like, this is not the way it should be. You're not to be enjoying your life, you know. Uh, the God is only about, you know, sacrifice and discipline and, you know, your life has got to be miserable because you need to be sacrificing and you need to be doing all the things you don't want to be doing. And you're going to send you to Africa or something like that, that... Uh, some people have this perspective of God that, that as soon as they begin to feel pleasure, they, they feel guilty or that they're sinning somehow because God is not into pleasure. Uh, that God is almost like the fun police, you know, you know, a person or a group of people who make others stop having fun. <laughs> you know, if we start to have too much pleasure in our life, then the, you know, God's like, shut it down because you're not allowed to have too much fun or too much pleasure or joy in your life because God is not into pleasure pleasure. You know, that if we put up these three words, you know, some people would say, well, there's one word that does not fit in that uh, list of three, 
and it's God. Fun and pleasure and God, that is not a mix because God is not into pleasure. And, and you may not think this outwardly, but a lot of folks subtly deep down inside actually believe this. That when they begin to experience pleasure in this world, there's something that wants to pull them back and rein in that laughter, rein in that fun, rein in that pleasure because, you know, this must, this must be off a little bit because God and pleasure do not mix. And this is why we have all these terms like sinfully good and guilty pleasure and sinful delight and, you know, like this is, this is sinfully good, this cake or this pie, because, you know, if I enjoy it too much, it must be, it must be wrong. You know, and in fact, we have a whole line of foods based on this idea, you know, sinful bakery and sinful colors, and we got sinful red wine and guilty pleasure wine, and forgetting that Jesus himself made the best wine in about 700 bottles of wine uh, for a party. <laughs> uh, but there's a subtle idea that somehow if this food tastes good and I start enjoying this food too much, or I start enjoying my things too much, or maybe, you know, the outdoors too much and I take too much pleasure and that somehow that's a, that's a sinful pleasure or it's a guilty pleasure that I should feel bad about it because God and pleasure don't mix. And so we're talking about God and pleasure today. And so let's begin by looking at some of the reflections from Ecclesiastes. So in verse 2 he says, I said to myself, Come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was, and the word is smoky. <laughs> not meaningless, not like it's all junk. It's, it's smoky. I can't control it. It's unknowable. It's a bit of a mystery. So I said laughter is silly. What good it does to, to seek pleasure? What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine and while seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. I amassed a fortune in silver and gold. I stockpiled the treasures of kings and provinces. I hired men and women to sing and entertain me. I pampered myself with whatever, uh, what every man desires, many women. So, he, I mean, he's got the capability of all the pleasures you could ever think of. As much money, as much women, as much pleasure, wine, whatever. Because he's doing an experiment. The whole book is about this experiment, about stretching life to the max. Just like he did with work. He worked all the time and did the biggest projects trying to find fulfillment in there. And he, he rattles it back to realizing that too much work is bad and being too lazy is bad. But it's kind of a balance. And he's doing this with pleasure as well. So uh, he's got all the stuff and many women and I surrounded myself with all this and became great, far greater than anyone who had ever lived in Jerusalem before me. And this is one of the reasons why this is probably not Solomon, as some people think, because, you know, as he mentioned in verse one, that I was, a, I was greater than all the kings who ever ruled before me in Jerusalem, which was just his dad, right? Which doesn't quite make sense. So some people think this was written on behalf of another king later on. But anyways, he's got all this stuff. And still, he says, my wisdom never left my side. So he's thinking through this as he's, he's trying all these pleasures. He, he's trying to carry this out in a wise way, thinking through this. Can I find ultimate fulfillment in this or not? And throughout this experiment, I let myself have anything my eyes desired. And I did not withhold from my mind any pleasure. I mean, just imagine that like going on this extreme pleasure rampage, if you will, as he goes, and, and just experiments with everything possible because he's got all the means. He's a king in those days in a patriarchal world. He had all the power. He could do whatever he wanted. And so he, he, he immerses himself in as much pleasure as possible. And he says, I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, including all that pleasure, he says, it was all so smoky, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. In other words, he, he, he does this grand experiment, just like he did with work, and next week we'll talk about wisdom. He does this with pleasure, and he's like, in the end, it's just smoky. I can't control it. I, I didn't find ultimate meaning there. I couldn't quite grasp what I, maybe I was looking for. It's like smoke. But again, he's not saying it's it's. it's unworthy or worthwhile or meaningless in our English. He says that it's smoky because he concludes this way. He says, so I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. And we talked about that last week. 
But then he says this, Then I realize that these pleasures are from the hand of God, for who can eat or enjoy anything apart from Him? So he has this other conclusion, that at the same time, it's kind of smoky, it didn't bring the ultimate happiness, but at the same time he says that all these pleasures, that this, this idea of pleasure in this world is actually from the hand of God. And so he has this conclusion that, that God isn't against pleasure because they're actually from the hand of God. And so the same idea of work, that work is partly from God. And so look for God in it. And he's going to have the same idea with pleasure that we need to look for God within our pleasures because they are the, uh, from the hand of God. And it's going to be difficult for some folks because... You know, we have often, especially his, historically in the church, dismissed sort of the natural realm from the spiritual realm. And so we think about the spiritual realm and all that is good and wonderful and beautiful and, you know, God is good in the spiritual realm, but it comes to anything physical like pleasures or things. We, we tend to dismiss God from that and we separate these worlds when we forget that God's kingdom is here and God is very much involved in our physical world. I mean, after all, he created it. And I just want to look a little bit at why sometimes we push back this idea of God being involved in our pleasure and God um, being, at, at, you know, like he says, that these pleasures are from God, the, the author of Ecclesiastes says. But right back from early church history, there has been sort of a pushback in the church when it comes to God and pleasure. Uh, and and we'll talk a little bit about the idea of sexuality because really this is where it stems from. The early church fathers and a lot of those teachers were, in their interpretations of the Bible, affected by their culture. Just as when we interpret the Bible, we're affected by our culture. There is no one who can ever say, no theologian, not you or me, who could ever say, I interpret the Bible without being affected by my culture. Everyone is affected the way they read the Bible is affected by the culture they live in, just as we are affected by our experiences, our teachers, the things that we've been taught, the things we've learned. It all goes into how we kind of filter the Bible and interpret the Bible. And it was the same in the early church because they were very much affected by what was known as Gnosticism, which was anything of the spirit was great. Anything that was physical was bad. And because pleasures often have to do with the physical realm, like eating and drinking and enjoying the outdoors or your possessions or, you know, a sexuality, because it had to do with the physical world, it was very much looked down upon. And so we see this begin to grow kind of in the early church. I mean, Origen, uh, he actually castrated himself to keep from sexual desires. He took it literally when Jesus says, you know, you, know, you, know, you, you cut off your hand or your eye, you gouge it out if you, you begin to get too lustful. Uh, Tertullian believed that the extinction of the human race was to be preferred over sexual relationships, even within marriage, because it was pleasurable, and, and that's part of the physical world, and God couldn't really be involved in that because only the spiritual things are good, and some of the physical stuff is not so good. And so there began this movement in the church that God is not involved in our pleasure and is actually not happy with our pleasure, and so this idea of sinful pleasures or guilty pleasures began to develop. You know, 600, the Pope at that time said, sensual pleasure can never be without sin. And so if you begin to feel any kind of sensual pleasure, whether it's from food or enjoying whatever it might be, that, that somehow you are sinning because it's not wrapped up in the spiritual realm. Again, they, they dismiss this idea that God is involved in all things, in our physical world as well as the spiritual world. You know, uh, and because of this, this idea of, you know, sexual temptation or pleasure through sex uh, it really got quite extreme with some of the saints. I mean, St. Benedict, when he began to feel sexual tensions, threw himself naked into a thorn bush. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi rolled in the snow, and St. Bernard jumped into an icy pond. So there's some techniques if you want. I don't know, but uh, again, it's this idea that somehow this is bad, and, and, and it's so sinful to have any sexual desires, to have any idea or desire for pleasure that I need to deal with it, and I need to deal with it severely. And so they would do some of these extreme things to get away from it. And because sex, pleasure, sexual pleasure, other pleasures were considered sinful, and God was not involved in those things, the church began to ban days in which you could even experience pleasure. So in the Middle Ages, like intercourse was banned on all Sundays and all the many feast days, as well as the 20 days before Christmas and the 40 days before Easter, and often 20 days before Pentecost, as well as three or more days before receiving communion, which didn't leave a lot of other days. Um, because God wasn't into that. And if you wanted to be pure, 
And if you actually wanted to be holy, then you better steer away from any pleasures because God's not into that. He's only in the, in the spiritual realm, but he's not involved in your, your kind of physical, uh, everyday reality world, especially when it comes to pleasure. And, and so this was all throughout church history, and it's still in the church today. I mean, even some of you might even be uncomfortable with me talking about this, even though most people in the world have sex and most people have sexual desires unless you're asexual. But to talk about these kinds of things like pleasurable things in church can make us really uncomfortable because it's often like, you know, God's not involved in this. Uh, God's involved when I pray and I read my Bible and I go to church and sing songs, but when I am actually enjoying a meal or I'm sitting out my outdoors in my garden having a lot of fun, that somehow God can't be involved. And he's definitely not involved in my sexual world, but it's, it's affected us. And this is back even in the evangelical church. I mean, sort of the height of this idea that God was against a lot of the stuff was the, the purity culture movement in the evangelical church was kind of reached its height in the 90s, which is this idea that was taught over and over again that you know, if you have sex before marriage, you're completely unpure and you've wrecked your entire marriage and your whole future, that, that sex is dirty and gross and so save it for the one you love or save it for the one you marry. And it's only coming out how much trauma purity culture has actually caused especially women, because it was very much directed at women that, you know, purity culture kind of taught in a very direct way that women were responsible for the sexual thoughts, feelings, and choices men make. And so must dress, walk, and talk in just the right way so not to inspire sexual thoughts, feelings, and actions in them. If they, they do inspire such thoughts, they, they are said to be a stumbling block. And, you know, men are really weak, and they got these horrible minds, and, you know, they're supposed to be our leaders, and women can't lead, but men can, but not in this area because they're really bad, and it's all women's fault, and there's been a lot of trauma that women have had to work through for both men and women because of pretty purity culture because for many men they've struggled with my mind is just horrible and rotten and gross and for many women struggling with body images because they were taught that their bodies were horrible rotten and gross and you know so save it for me for marriage and then it's all of a sudden good for some reason but it, it partly stems from this idea that anything pleasurable is god's not in it and um and, 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 but the reality is the Bible speaks quite differently about certain things. I mean, we go right back to the very beginning and because we look at this, we are not in a Gnostic world. And so we read our Bible differently than they would have in the early church when they were soaked in a Gnostic world. But the Bible, I mean, says a lot about sex being good. And of course, this is kind of the heart of pleasure, but it would stem into all the pleasures that we enjoy in life. I mean, Genesis 2, it said the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. I mean, just think about how much shame there is around sexuality because of the subtle idea that God's not <laughs> into that at all and you better not enjoy anything about there and especially, you know, this idea of you, you never, you shouldn't self-pleasure yourself ever because that's totally God's not, the Bible doesn't say a thing about it. Science has said that it's actually very, very healthy and very psychologically good for you. Uh, but in Genesis 1, you know, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. I mean, God told them to, to do it, if you will. Uh, Genesis 1, God saw all that he made after this, and he said it was very good. Like, God created all this very good, the, the, the pleasures of sexuality, the pleasures of enjoying this garden, of course, the pleasures of walking with God and all that spiritual stuff. But they were all this God was wrapped up in both the spiritual world and the physical world, and yet somehow we want to divide those two things. And, and God's only in the spiritual stuff and all this physical stuff that I enjoy you know, God can't be in it somehow. And there's a whole book on the celebration of pleasure in the Bible. It's called the, the Song of Songs. And we see these beautiful pictures of, of pleasure uh, between people like in songs, a Song of Songs 7, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom, there I will give you my love. That this book really is a celebration of the pleasures that God has given us and this picture that God is in them and, and celebrates with us. And of course, this book can be quite sexual at times because, and again, that might like push us away a little bit, but God created that stuff and he's involved with that stuff because he is involved in that world. I mean, we see like in Song of Songs 7, it says your breasts you know, like clusters of fruit. I will, I said, I will climb the palm tree and I'll take hold of its fruit. I mean, they can get quite sensual. 
And again, this might make us uncomfortable, but, but God is reminding us that he is very much involved in our world of pleasure. And it's what the writer of Ecclesiastes says. And he says, I realize that all these pleasures are from the hand of God, that we can't be people who dismiss this. Because if we're followers of Jesus, we realize that the Spirit of God is always at work in everything we do. And it is a gift from God and to see God in all we do, including our world of pleasures. Now, there are some people who interpret the Song of Songs not in a a literal way that that talks about the celebration of sex. There are some who interpret this more allegorically. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Um, But it can be confusing at times. I mean, this idea of the two breasts, I mean, if you look at some of the allegorical interpretations, well, this can't be talking about breasts because God is not into that kind of thing, so it must mean something else. The two breasts are Moses and Aaron, or some will say it's Moses and and, and Finehaz, or Joshua and Eliezer, or maybe it's the church from which we feed. Or maybe it's the two testaments, or maybe it's about loving God and loving people, or blood and water, or outer and the inner man. I mean, when you get into allegory, it just kind of goes everywhere. Uh, there are some people who hold to this, and I, maybe some of you do, and you know, that's okay. I'm not going to argue that. But, you know, modern scholarship has moved away from that. And part of the reason is, is because a lot of this allegorical interpretation kind of grew up in the Gnostic world where, you know, physical things are bad and spiritual things are good. You know, Dr. Temper Longman said, this song is, first of all, a celebration of, of sex, or Dr. Horace Hummel is a scholar, said modern scholarship has moved massively and almost unanimously away from allegory. Uh, because there is this, this reclamation, if you will, of this idea that, that God is involved in all of our lives. Not just this spiritual world, but when you go to work and when you're driving in your car and when you're eating breakfast and when you're enjoying sex with your, your husband or wife or whatever it might be, that God is a part of all of that. That as the, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, he's intimately involved. It's, it's a gift. And if you're interested in that, I mean, uh, Dan Allender, who is an uh, amazing Christian psychologist, Timber Longman III, is an amazing scholar, wrote a whole book on just this idea of, of God involved in our sexuality. And I would recommend this book if you want to so read it. Uh, but God, again, is very much involved in our pleasure. I mean, if you look at the definition of pleasure, it's a feeling of happiness, enjoyment, or satisfaction. Uh, Psalm 16 says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I mean, it's like God is the master of pleasure. At his right hand, which means his strong, is a strong part of him, that there are pleasures. And when we think about heaven, we might think about that, but there is also this idea of the kingdom here and heaven here, and we can see God at work in our pleasures. I mean, God even takes pleasure in physical things we see in the scripture. And sometimes after you finish your, res- you know, maybe your renovation or your, your, your project that you've been working on, you're like, oh, I better not take too much pleasure in that because God's not going to want me to take too much pleasure in my house. Well, God certainly took pleasure in his house. I mean, in Haggai 1, he says, go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. And this is talking about a physical building. And uh, I mean, God is in that. When you look at some of the things that you've created, the things you put your hand to, that, that project in your car or your house or your garden. I mean, it is okay to say, wow, I, I really take pleasure in this and to see God in that because God is behind all that. God has allowed you to work and he's allowed you to be creative and he's, he's, he's happy that you are taking pleasure in things. And we can't talk about this without this idea that God actually takes pleasure in you and I. This feeling of happiness, enjoyment, or satisfaction. It says in Ephesians 1, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Not a sinful pleasure or a guilty pleasure, but a good heavenly pleasure when he looks at you. That you actually give God pleasure great pleasure, the sense of happiness and satisfaction and joy. Because at his right hand, eternally, are these, these, these pleasures he talks about. In fact, in the Old Testament, and we've lost some of this because uh, we've lost some of this idea of celebration in the church, but in the Old Testament, I mean, God actually had to like command folks to have celebrations and to enjoy themselves and to have fun in the, in, in the world. And they had all these feasts at which they were to have incredible joy, like Deuteronomy 16. 
Uh, there are commandments to celebrate, like uh, be joyful at your festival, he says. You, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites and the foreigners and the followers and the widows who live in your towns. For seven days, celebrate the festival to the Lord your God at the place the Lord will choose. For the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and all the work of your hands and your joy will be complete. He says, be joyful at your festivals, which for us would be like, a, you know, a gathering, a church party or a party with friends. I mean, be joyful because God is a God of joy. I mean, the fruit of the Spirit is love and then joy. <laughs> I think some of us could laugh more. But, you know, you know, a lot of people even have problems with people laughing in church. You can cry, but don't laugh. <laughs> you know, don't, don't laugh in church because God's not for all that happiness stuff. And Nehemiah 8, then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people who had been weeping as they listened to the word of the law. Nehemiah said, go, enjoy choice food and sweet drink. What? <laughs> Nehemiah said that, go enjoy food and drinks. He's like, and God's not into that. Well, Nehemiah, Nehemiah thought so. Go enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. And send to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to the Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And, and, and we see a lot of this in the Old Testament. These God laying out these commands to have fun, be joyful, enjoy yourself, see God in the pleasures around you. You know, we look at Jesus, I mean, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but a lot of the pictures of Jesus are quite somber. And there's not a lot of smiling Jesus. And, and there were times when he, you know, wept over Jerusalem. Uh, there were times when he, of course, he's, you know, healing the leper in those moments would have been very difficult. He's weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. And those are those times when he was weeping and sad and down and, and grieving over things. But, but there are other times when he, obviously was full of joy. It, it talks a lot about that, like in Luke 10. And Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, which means he probably didn't walk around the whole time like, you know, grumpy looking, like he's been sucking on sour lemons. I mean, uh, full of joy, or, or John 15, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. And we see these images of Jesus having fun and, and enjoying the pleasures, if you will, uh, these gifts of God, like in Matthew 11, it says, the son of man came eating and drinking, and they said, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And you notice the Pharisees had this view that God can't be in that. And here's Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. He's eating and drinking. He's like seeming to have pleasure, and he's having a party and hanging with these people. God could never be involved with that because God and pleasure don't mix. And so, you know, he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And, you know, that is still in the hearts of some followers of Jesus. That somehow those things can't mix because God is only involved in spiritual stuff and not involved in the, in the physical realm. You know, I like these pictures of Jesus. Because I think that a lot of times Jesus was happy. <laughs> I think he enjoyed hanging out with people and had a smile on his face because after all, he, was, he is the most joyful being ever. <laughs> he is full of joy. And, uh, and it's okay for you to smile. And it's okay for you to have fun. And it's okay for you to enjoy things in life and to actually feel deep pleasure. And in that moment, say, I am worshiping God to the full in this moment because I'm experiencing these gifts that he has given me, which is these immense pleasure, whether that's in your work or in your sexuality or in whatever it might be. As the writer of Ecclesiastes says, I I've seen these all as a gift from God. As I've noted, the fruit of the Spirit is love and then joy. I like what Martin Luther said. He said, you have as much laughter as you have faith. I think we'd laugh a little bit more in church. <laughs> uh, but I remember, I think it was like, the, was the Toronto Blessing when all the laughing was going on? How, how, you know, it was very controversial because, you know, they're laughing in church. And it was controversial in other ways. But, I mean, I think we laugh more in church because we have a God of joy. Jesus is full of joy. We have a lot of gifts around. Life is hard, yes, but there are gifts that we can celebrate and we have a hard time having fun. In fact, some of the recent studies have shown that one of the hardest emotions adults have in expressing in our world today is the emotion of fun, an emotion of joy. Because we get so wrapped up in our work and our things and, our, and you know, we, we have a hard time having fun. So we gotta laugh more, according to Martin Luther. 
Now, all this, of course, is in, in context. Because <laughs> some of you are wondering, well, how far does this pleasure thing go? Well, here's just some other, other points here as we roll to an end here. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 says, and by the way, this is a great summary of the teaching of Ecclesiastes on pleasure. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. First, he notes that, that don't put all your hope in wealth because it's, it's uncertain, or as the wor words of Ecclesiastes, it's smoke. <laughs> Don't put all your hope in pleasure because it's smoke. Don't put all your hope in work because it's smoke. Don't put all your hope in wealth because it's smoke. It could disappear. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in our world. You can't find your ultimate hope in that. It'll always lead to disappointment. But when you see God at work in all these things, and note how he says this, God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Whoa, that's kind of what Ecclesiastes said. God actually provides things so we can enjoy them, so that we can have pleasure. I see is what he's saying. Again, we, we want to dismiss God from enjoyment or dismiss God from our pleasures. He's actually provided them as every good and perfect gift comes down from above, whether that's in the spiritual realm or in this, this physical world we live on, live in. Ecclesiastes 7.4 and just to balance this out a little bit more, he says, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. I mean, pleasure is good. It's a gift. It's wonderful. We celebrate it. But that's not our whole world. And as he does this grand experiment of experiencing every kind of pleasure, he has some of these summaries. And one of these summaries is, it's not good to be in the house of pleasure all the time because there are people who are hurting and people who are in need and people who are grieving, and you also need to be able to sit with those folks. As the scriptures say, you rejoice with those who rejoice, and you mourn with those who are mourning. Enjoy pleasures as the gift of God, and enjoy, have fun, laugh, but also, you, you got to sit with the real world. And there's times when you're going to be crying, and others are going to be crying, and you kind of pull out of that world of pleasure, and you go sit with somebody who is hurting, and you, you connect with them, and maybe that's you yourself, where you're not enjoying anything pleasurable because you're going through a hard time. Uh, again, this idea that, that life is like smoke, you can't control it, you can't live in the world of pleasure all the time, but you don't want to live in the world of misery all the time, but look for these gifts of God around you. And this idea that pleasure alone cannot bring happiness is part of what Ecclesiastes is saying. 2 Timothy 3 says that there are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And people who are trying to find ultimate meaning in pleasure without God, or people who, on the other hand, are, are, are having all these pleasures but dismissing God. And the church has done that a lot. Where they just separate these two things rather than seeing God at work and loving God and seeing the gift of God in, in pleasure. Colossians 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. You cannot dismiss the presence of God from anything in your life. All things hold together. That means those moments of pleasure, whatever it might be, God is wrapped up in it and he's in there and he's so intertwined because he can't even separate him. He created and he's ingrained and his, his, his spirit is there. I mean, God is very much involved in your world of pleasure. And the ultimate meaning, I think the book of Ecclesiastes would say, is when you begin to realize that. When you don't dismiss these two things, you don't live for pleasure alone, but you begin to see God in that, that you can begin to experience some of the deepest pleasures when all of a sudden you don't have to say that was a sinful delight or a guilty pleasure. You can say that was a heavenly delight. That was a kingdom pleasure because God was wrapped up all in that as I was enjoying that moment or the, whatever that thing might be. And just in conclusion, I just wrote this out as a conclusion to this topic. The more we pursue pleasure on our own terms, the less we will have. Some think that seeking pleasure comes at the expense of controlling, disregarding, or shaming others. This is empty pleasure at its best. When we experience pleasure on God's terms, we, are actually, we will actually experience more of it. 
The deepest pleasure exists within a context, the context of God, love and consent. Pleasure is true when your actions aren't harming others. Pleasure should never control, harm, shame, or enslave another. And so pleasure is wrapped up in this idea of loving God and loving people. And when you pull pleasure and loving God and loving people into this mix, I mean, that is when you experience the deepest pleasure in life. And so Ecclesiastes would say, it's not your ultimate hope, but see God in it and involve God in it.